it was June of this year that um, in uh, central Dublin, it's sometimes called the, the Battle of Dublin or the Battle of the Four Courts, really, um, when about 200 um, IRA members were held up in the hold up in the um, in central Dublin. Um, and this was a battle of uh, IRA members uh, against IRA members, you know, or former IRA members, perhaps. Um, and once again, uh, central, the city, the center of, uh, of Dublin was heavily shelled by, well, by the National Army of Ireland. Um, and, uh, and largely kind of, uh, well, destroyed and, and lots of buildings damaged and so on. Um, <clears throat> but these, um, these members of the IRA, they'd set up uh, an armed occupation in the Four Courts, which is the main judicial building in Ireland. Uh, it was kind of the center of the, the high courts and all that, all the main crimes were tried there. It was obviously a, a, a significant uh, building as part of uh, the, uh, the British colonial apparatus in Ireland and also the, the, the founding of this, um, this new state, Irish state. Um, <clears throat> and they took over this, they were saying, you know, to say they were taking a stand for Irish freedom. Like Cal said, much like in uh, April 1916, when um, members of the uh, Irish Republican Brotherhood, the Irish Volunteers, what would become the IRA, took over the, uh, the General Post Office in central Dublin. Again, another kind of significant uh, public building. Um, and like in 1916, they were opposed by a much superior military force. Um, and their actions in taking control of the four courts was largely met by uh, ambivalence from the, the local population, really. So they had no fighting chance, to be honest, um, in, uh, in launching this occupation. Although, mainly they were trying to, I think, apply moral pressure to their former comrades. Um, because, unlike 1916, this battle in central Dublin, um, the forces that opposed these uh, IRM members, this occupation, um, was not the, the British army or any kind of a, you know, a outside foreign imperialist army or force. Instead, it was their former comrades in arms and former members of, uh, of, the, uh, of the IRA um, who were led in this battle, in fact, by you know, what was certainly the most famous and most popular IRA commander of the day, uh, Michael Collins. Now, Collins, people will probably know from some of the films, perhaps starring Liam Neeson, um, uh, it was famous for his role in the Civil War, or in the War of Independence, rather, um, in building up the kind of the IRA's intelligence apparatus, um, and how he set up the, uh, the Dublin uh, Active Service Unit, um, infiltrated Dublin Castle, which was the kind of headquarters of the British uh, administration, um, and, you know, plotted uh, assassinations and uh, intimidation of police officers, army officers, this kind of thing. Um, central, really, to the IRA's uh, campaign in the War of Independence. Um, and this fighting, you know, comrade against comrade, this fratricidal conflict that uh, it only lasted a couple of, of weeks, really, um, was the result of a really bitter split in the IRA executive, in its leadership, um, but also in its ranks and in the wider Republican movement in Ireland uh, as well. Um, uh, and this, uh, this split was over, essentially, um, was called the, uh, the Anglo-Irish uh, Treaty. Um, and this, uh, this split, as I think I'll kind of mainly talk about in my, in my lead-off, and uh, I guess what was the point to get to, this, this split in the Irish Republican movement, um, really represented the kind of uh, internal counter-revolution of, uh, of Irish bourgeois nationalism and the beginning of uh, a counter-revolutionary process in Ireland that would, uh, that would bring Ireland's revolutionary period to an end. Um, uh, the, uh, this treaty, anyway, this Anglo-Irish Treaty, um, had brought an end to the three-year, roughly three-year, uh, War of Independence in Ireland that started not long after the, uh, the Easter Rising in 1916. Um, uh, when, you know, it is, it is said, of course, in this war that uh, the British Empire was, was, after hundreds of years, finally uh, brought to its knees by the resistance of the Irish people uh, and by um, their, their campaign and support for the IRA and other uh, you know, methods of resistance. Um, and this, uh, you know, this period of the War of Independence from kind of uh, you know, 1917, 18 onwards really, um, is not just, it's not just a period of uh, guerrilla struggles, um, of the IRA's flying columns and so on, the famous parts that you maybe see again in, in the films and kind of are, are passed into Irish legend, really. Um, this period 
uh, you know, prior to the Four Courts and prior to the, the beginning of the Civil War, um, was also a period of, of class struggles, of, of workers' struggles, of the struggles of uh, poor tenant farmers against their landlords. Um, you know, there they was a period that saw many, many strikes, occupations, uh, land seizures even. Um, and uh, famous episodes of, of class struggle and of, of even of workers' power in Ireland, like the, uh, the famous uh, Limerick Soviet in uh, 1919, when workers took over the city and, uh, and ran it for a couple of weeks um, uh, through uh, a general kind of committee. Um, this period, you know, this was the Irish Revolution, I think you could say, in, uh, in full colour, you know, when it was not just green, uh, but red. And... This whole revolutionary period, as you would imagine, was extremely stormy and stressful for British imperialism. They really were losing, uh, losing control of the situation. The administration uh, that was largely headquartered in Dublin Castle um, was practically cut off from large swathes of the country um, by, uh, well, by the kind of IRA's campaigns and by um, all kinds of uprisings. Um, taxes you know, and duties were not paid or collected. Um, people, instead of going to uh, the, the traditional uh, kind of British-sponsored courts, when they had problems, they went instead to the, the Dole courts, these uh, Republican alternatives that had been set up um, in order to you know, seek redress or, or whatever it might be. Um, the, the police, the Royal Irish Constabulary, a kind of uh, semi-militarized colonial police force, as well as the army itself. Um, were largely restricted and kind of confined to a few areas and, to, and had to sort of stay in their barracks because of uh, the fear of just the constant uh, ambushes that they faced from the IRA um, and the raids on rural uh, police stations that meant they had to, uh, had to withdraw to mainly only the, the big towns and so on. Um, they were, uh, it was very clear they were, they were losing control of the situation and Ireland could no longer be held or governed by the sword as had been done for hundreds of years. Um, and, of course, in this period, we, everyone will be familiar, I think, with the, the desperate means to which the British turned to try and subjugate the population. Uh, the use of uh, the black and tans to terrorise the population, famous episodes like the burning of Cork, the Croke Park massacre, and so on. Um, but uh, this only uh, made the situation worse, really, for British imperialism. It further alienated the population, the broad masses of the population, but also even including you know, the middle and upper classes be began to see uh, British rule in Ireland as, as untenable, as, as, as uh, covered in blood from head to foot as it was. Um, and even the, uh, even the Catholic Church in this period changed sides from uh, its historic opposition and kind of hostility to revolutionary Irish uh, republicanism um, to uh, instead uh, embracing it you know, as a moral and just cause um, and uh, condemning the sins of, of British imperialism, such was the, uh, the effect of, um, of this kind of period of struggle. Um, and I, I think it could be said, you know, this is a, a kind of historic point, that perhaps if, uh, if Britain had really concentrated its full forces on Ireland um, against the IRA and against the strikes and occupations and so on, um, then uh, perhaps they could have reconquered, they could have uh, held control, really. But uh, this was uh, out of the question. They, they didn't have the ability to do this uh, in this period. Um, uh, colonial rebellions were unfolding not just in Ireland, but also in Egypt, in India, and in other kind of parts of the, of the British Empire. And these kind of places, you know, in Africa and in Asia, much wealthier conquests for Britain than, than Ireland was. So they were willing to, uh, so it was much more, uh, uh, you know, a uh, focus for for the British imperialists of the day. Um, and, uh, and yeah, they, they simply couldn't afford to continue to hold Ireland uh, by the sword, as, uh, as I said. Um, now, the, despite this, I mean, in this period, the IRA struggle, I think, was no doubt a heroic one and a broadly popular one as well. Um, was supported kind of uh, in small towns all over the kind of country and uh, particularly in, in the south and the west of Ireland famously as well. Um, and when Britain finally, seemingly, caved to the pressure, offered negotiations to the IRA leadership, uh, there was jubilation. Thousands of people flooded into the ranks of the IRA, uh, people who had maybe been kind of a bit passive before. They now saw that uh, victory was, was uh, within, within grasp, and uh, they wanted to play their part. Um, we can imagine, you know, how full of hope people were, um, that they'd finally fought and won freedom from their historic oppressor. Um, 
uh, in a country scarred for centuries by poverty and exploitation and all the kind of miseries of, of imperialism and of capitalism, you can imagine what freedom would finally mean to these people and uh, what a precious thing it would be. Um, and the kind of debates that would rage over the question of what it really means to, uh, for, for Ireland to be free. Um, because the, uh, the treaty that was introduced or, or offered by Britain, um, in fact, didn't mention anywhere this Irish Republic that all the members of the IRA and their supporters thought that they were fighting and struggling for, that they said had been, had been declared already and existed de facto from 1916, and that the, the Dole courts and the, the Republican Assembly, the Dole was also um, you know, elected, uh, an elected government of this, uh, this republic. Um, instead of a republic, the treaty instead said that Ireland would be a, a free state, kind of a novel term. Um, it would remain within the British Empire, um, in which the people's representatives elected in Ireland would have to swear an oath of loyalty to, uh, to the King of England continually. Um, and this king, of course, would be represented in Ireland by his by head of state, um, an imperial viceroy, who would uh, have the final kind of a, you know a say over legislation or whatever else. And the treaty itself would take precedence over any constitution that the Irish government would pass. So it was essentially a, a treaty of um, of uh, continued colonial uh, subjugation, really. Um, and to what amounted to, really, uh, a majority of the IRA ranks, many of its, uh, its veteran members, um, those who had fought in the war, this treaty that was offered was uh, just an insult, really. Um, additional uh, onerous conditions that the uh, Irish had to agree to included the, uh, the maintenance of British Navy ports uh, around Ireland and their garrisons, um, and as well as all kinds of annuities and reparations that uh, Irish people would have to pay for generations to Britain to supposedly, I don't know, pay back England for all the, the civilizing work that it had done in Ireland. Um, and most relevant perhaps to, to today and to contemporary political crises of the British state, um, Ireland was uh, partitioned into two states by this treaty as well, um, in uh, the north and the south. 26 counties of Ireland, they would uh, be a part of this Irish Free State in the south. Um, and six would be, uh, you know, given the choice, but it was kind of uh, a done deal, fait accompli. Uh, six counties, they would remain a part of the United Kingdom as they do to this day. So, I don't know if you can uh, imagine maybe being um, an IRA veteran and like hearing this proposal. Um, and then maybe imagine that when you hear this, uh, it's not just a, a draft treaty. It's not a first uh, run over. You know, it's not the, the the maximum that Britain wants to get. Instead, this is what the IRA leadership have uh, have actually agreed to. They've said that they're going to submit this for ratification. Um, and uh, more than that, it's not just a, a treaty, uh, a draft treaty. Um, but the man who signs on the dotted line to agree to this proposal, this draft. Uh, was none other than the Michael Collins, you know, one of the, the most uh, heroic figure. Probably the reason many people joined the IRA, basically. Um, but uh, they, I think many must have reacted in the same way that uh, Lenin probably reacted when he heard of the German SPD's betrayal in 1914. He probably thought, this is, this is surely this is British forgery. This can't be true that they've actually said that they're going to accept this deal. Um, but many were shocked and I think assumed that it would be rejected out of hand, that Collins had, uh, had failed and screwed up maybe, he'd been tricked perhaps, and uh, when, the bill, when the draft treaty gets submitted towards to, to a dollar, Aaron, then uh, you know, it wouldn't be ratified, it'd be rejected, and maybe the war would continue or whatever. People weren't quite sure what exactly what happened after this. But um, instead, it narrowly passed in the Dole. It was a very, very tense vote and a tense debate. I'm sure lifelong friendships were destroyed uh, in the, the days of debate. Um, all kinds of abuse was kind of slung around, um, and either side accused each other of treachery, of endangering the country, of, uh, of giving up what little freedom they'd already achieved in order to achieve you know, the, the perfect freedom, and so on. We can imagine what kind of debates people would have had on, the, on these kind of sides, the, maybe the more gradualist approach versus the people who um, took a more principled approach to, to, um, to independence. Um, Michael Collins, he, uh, he argued that, this, this uh, point of view, that uh, the treaty would be a stepping stone to a republic, 
And his famous phrase was, this gives us the freedom to achieve freedom. Um, he firmly believed that the IRA didn't have the ability to, to struggle any, any longer. That In fact, he thought that um, uh, if, they, if they continued for six months of war, Britain would increase its number of troops and uh, perhaps uh, crush them. Um, and he, he also, and others on his side, also he argued that you know, even by granting negotiation, uh, Britain had already kind of conceded Irish uh, sovereignty. So this was not really a, a substantial kind of matter. They had already granted a little bit of independence to Ireland by agreeing to negotiate with an Irish Republican government. Um, but uh, the anti-treaty faction um, was led by Eamon de Valera. So he was the official actual president of this provisional Republican government. He was a president of Dáil Éireann. Um, he argued that it was, the treaty was an unacceptable infringement on Irish sovereignty, uh, that it was a betrayal of this Irish Republic that had been declared in 1916, that all of the, uh, the IRA's attack campaign had been dedicated towards uh, establishing, in fact, um, and that uh, the, uh, the, the program of the Dáil itself uh, was essentially being betrayed and scrapped by the acceptance of this, of this treaty. Um, but like I said, the, uh, the anti-treaty side, they narrowly lost this kind of vote. Um, after losing de Valera, he, uh, he walked out, he and his, his supporters walked out. They denounced the vote as illegitimate. They said, uh, you know, this doll cannot vote uh, to dissolve the Irish Republic. Um, and uh, in the months, the ensuing months, basically, this, uh, this split uh, deepened and became ever more bitter. Uh, within the IRA and the broad uh, Republican uh, movement. And all of this really culminated in the attack on the four courts um, and marked the, the beginning, essentially, of the Irish Civil War. Um, now, the four courts is, I think in most Irish histories, it's a bit kind of glanced over because it was unsuccessful. It was not very you know, popular. But I think it's a, a, a very important episode because the attack on the four courts, the whole, uh, whole drama surrounding it, really reveals you know, the true nature of this, uh, this Anglo-Irish treaty, you know, what it really represented for Britain and uh, for Ireland, um, that it was really just a, a trap for Irish nationalism. Um, because the negotiations for this treaty uh, had been opened by the, uh, the Liberal Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, which uh, many will, will probably know, you know, Lenin regarded Lloyd George as one of the more far-sighted and intelligent bourgeois statesmen uh, who could, uh, who could uh, you know, flexibly, I guess, apply the, the policies of imperialism and, uh, and update them as needed. Um, from uh, Lloyd George's perspective, uh, Ireland could not be held any longer by a foreign ruling class, um, and instead, perhaps a semi-independent native ruling class could be used to, to keep order in Ireland and, uh, and you know, keep, the, keep the profits rolling, keep the money rolling in. Um, now Collins, who, Michael Collins, he led the kind of, uh, the, the dole, the Republican side in these negotiations. Um, he spoke quite openly of how Lord George tried to corrupt him when he went to these uh, meetings. He would take him and show him, you know, one of these gigantic maps they used to have in every school of the British Empire, you know, from uh, east to west, and said, you know, told him, look, um, give up this demand for Irish independence and Irish Republic, and look, you could be, you could be a partner in all of this. Ireland, Britain, you know, we go way back, and uh, we, could finally, uh, we can finally stand as equals, you know, we'll give you a little bit of respect, and uh, you'll, get your, uh, you'll get your share of the loot, you know, of, uh, of British imperialism. And now this, um, I think this kind of washed over Collins, he obviously wrote in his, his diary about how he, he could see right, right through it. Um, but this was really uh, not so much directed, I think, at Collins himself, but uh, over his head, really. Uh, it's an attempt to make a, a, an appeal, a class appeal from Lloyd George to the class sensibilities of the bourgeois nationalists, people more like W.T. Cosgrave, Arthur Griffith, and others who were leaders of the uh, provisional Repu uh, Republican government. Um, uh, Collins, yeah, he, he resisted you know, this, this illusion. Um, but nonetheless, he agreed um, to the, the terms of, of the treaty. He brought it back um, and, uh, and said this was the best that they could really uh, they could achieve. Um, and of course, after this, this would eventually lead in, in June 1922 to him in his uh, spiffing new Irish National Army uniform with his uh, you know tailored leather gloves and everything like this. Um, would turn British-made guns, guns they'd been left behind or, or gifted by the British Army, to the new Irish National Army. 
uh, turn these on his former comrades who were holed up in the uh, barricaded in the four courts building, um, shelling it, you know, <laughs> one round a minute. The same kind of tactics that were used by the British in, in April 1916. Um, and he did this at the, the insistence of Lloyd George um, and of uh, Winston Churchill as well, who was also a, a cabinet minister at this time. And in fact, it was Churchill who told uh, Collins directly that either um, the Irish provisional government, the, Irish, the free state government, um, they, uh, they, they deal with these rebels led by uh, Rory O'Connor, who's the kind of leader of the Four Courts Occupation, that they had to be put down by the Irish government, uh, or else they would consider the treaty violated and the 70-odd thousand uh, troops that could be sent to Britain, they would be sent straight away. Um, and uh, there would be no treaty, there would be no free state, um, and uh, continuation, really. Now, Michael Collins, I think, he may have resisted uh, Lloyd George's attempts to charm him, um, but he clearly heeded... Uh, the threats that were issued by Lloyd George. Um, he was told that a great and terrible war would be unleashed on Ireland if they did not accept the treaty. And then even afterwards, the pressure kept going. He said, like I said, you know, that there would be threats of intervention if they did not crack down on this anti-treaty movement, uh, which represented really the, the, ma the majority of the armed uh, ranks of the IRA. Um, Collins himself wanted to conciliate, you know, he tried to, and even those on the anti-treaty side, like uh, Liam Lynch, Cathal Brewer, they wanted to conciliate, they didn't want to turn to violence and, and fight each other, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the ultimatum was issued by Britain, and uh, Collins carried through, carried through on it. Um, and the background to this, you know, there was, uh, uh, you know, a, a increasing kind of pressure, basically, because of uh, things like the uh, assassination in 1922 of uh, Sir Henry Wilson, who was a kind of British general, and uh, there was a lot of kind of confusion over this because Michael Collins had officially ordered this assassination to take place and had set up the uh, you know the mission and everything for it, but um, that had all been arranged prior to the the beginning of the treaty negotiations. And I guess the guys who uh, you know did it they thought, oh well, it's still on. We've not got the you know the 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 call off. So um, they uh, they assassinated uh, this this British general um, as well as IRA. Um, activity in, in Northern Ireland. These were things that uh, led Britain to, to demand um, that the uh, Free State crack down on the anti-treaty movement. Now, this uh, anti-treaty movement, you know, what became known as the, uh, the Irregulars in the Civil War, um, they had taken the four courts in Dublin, uh, but their main strongholds basically were the former kind of IRA strongholds uh, in the south and west of Ireland from the time of the War of Independence. Um, and they, like I said, they were also still very much active in, uh, in the north of Ireland, um, despite the, uh, the partitioning of, of the country. Um, and in fact, this partition immediately, as was predicted by James Connolly and in fact many other Irish uh, you know, Republicans throughout history, um, resulted in a wave of sectarian attacks and violence in the north as, uh, as kind of Protestant and uh, you know, uh, Unionist uh, groups tried to drive Catholic families away out of their homes. Um, there was, a, as is always the case with these, these sectarian fights, there's kind of tit-for-tat violence. But uh, Catholics were primarily uh, the victims, Irish Catholics were primarily the victims of this violence. And in fact, uh, thousands were forced to flee south to leave Northern Ireland um, and, uh, and resettle elsewhere. And, you know, the, the Northern IRA and, uh, and nationalists in the North, uh, they certainly felt left behind by all of this, by, by the, the, even by, by the Civil War. Um, partition was really not uh, a huge concern to many of the nationalists in the South. Uh, even Eamon de Valera was actually willing to, to, to accept it and tolerate it as a, as a condition for um, uh, kind of self-government to Ireland. Um, uh, yeah, de Valera and Collins were both kind of, a, kind of agreed on this and, uh, and neither side saw it as a permanent fixture either. Unlike the Irish ruling class today, they probably really couldn't care less about reunifying the country. Um, but uh, in the southwest of Ireland, uh, it was the anti-treaty IRA chief, Liam Lynch. He was considering establishing this uh, Munster Republic down there uh, to rebel against the Irish Free State, essentially de deprive, deprive it the opportunity to, um, to consolidate itself. And this, uh, this you know, republic was just talked about. It would never really come to be established in any way. Um, but it was in August 1922 that uh, the situation really, really turned and became... Uh, uh, much more bitter between the two sides. Because it was in August that Michael Collins was assassinated. He was making a tour of uh, many areas around Ireland, 
And against the advice of many of his uh, close advisors, he visited his native Cork uh, county, and it was there that he was caught in an ambush um, and killed, basically. He was the only person killed in this ambush, in fact. Um, and it was, a, it was a shock, really, to, I think, all of Ireland. Like I said, he was a, a figure with enormous moral and political authority um, on both sides. Even those on the anti-treaty side were, were stunned by this happening. Um, half a million people turned out to his funeral, um, just to show the, the levels of popularity. Um, and this assassination, after, I guess, a brief period of mourning, really all it resulted in was a, a massive increase in the repression targeted against the anti-treaty forces. You know? Some say that maybe Collins, you know, he was, again, trying to conciliate, was holding back the worst elements of the state. Perhaps that's true. <laughs> um, but after his death, anyway, the, the repression uh, escalated dramatically. Uh, thousands of anti-treaty Republicans were rounded up and interned in camps, uh, often without trial or, uh, or any kind of a chance of appeal, um, and often without really much evidence apart from one witness saying, oh yeah, he's uh, an anti-treaty, yeah, he's an irregular. Um, many, including the, the leaders of the Four Courts Occupation, they were uh, interned and they were executed uh, by, by firing squad. Um, a policy of shoot on sight for uh, irregulars was introduced. Um, and anyone, a new law was passed that uh, anyone could be arrested and executed for uh, uh, unauthorized possession of, of a gun or a firearm. Um, uh, one of the first victims of this law actually was uh, Erskine uh, Childers. He was an English man who had sympathized uh, with the Irish uh, struggle. He had smuggled weapons for the IRA during the War of Independence, and he'd even served as a, a secretary to Michael Collins during the negotiations and during his leadership of the uh, active service unit. Um, but nonetheless, uh, Childers, he was arrested and executed for possessing a pistol that Michael Collins had personally gifted to him. Um, and many others, of course, were, died in similar circumstances. And by the end of the next year, by the end of 1923, um, 12,000 people had been interned in uh, these kind of camps uh, around Ireland. Uh, as well as these police state uh, kind of repressions, the National Army of the Free State uh, expanded exponentially. Um, by early 1923, there were in fact more troops as members of the Irish National Army deployed around Ireland than uh, Britain had ever deployed to Ireland to, uh, to keep control of it. Um, the majority of these were recruited out of elements who uh, had kind of sat by during the War of Independence and done nothing, maybe joined the IRA just at the end. Um, quite a kind of inert, basically, uh, layers, rather than IRA veterans, really. Um, and, uh, you know, they kind of rushed to join, I guess, when it looked like uh, victory was possible. Um, plus, a dedicated core of Collins' uh, loyalists, uh, the, the Dublin Brigade of the IRA, uh, formed the core of this, this new army. And uh, it was, in fact, incredibly powerful in Ireland because of its, its size and uh, social weight. And this army, of course, was armed to the teeth by British imperialism, you know. You can tell they probably offered them a, a big discount um, on weapons. Um, and they were used to uh, encircle, isolate, and eventually completely destroy the anti-treaty forces um, of, the, of the IRA. Uh, the fighting was incredibly one-sided, you know. The anti-treaty IRA they had insufficient uh, weapons or ammunition and insufficient numbers even to fight uh, versus the National Army who had armoured cars, machine guns, uh, and even uh, limited um, uh, air support. Um, and how bloody this war was, in the roughly 10 months of fighting, more people lost their lives than in the three years of the War of Independence. Um, it's safe to say that the anti-treaty IRA was completely smashed, basically. Um, as well as this, there were brutal, brutal uh, feuds and recriminations all around the country. Uh, families were quite literally divided uh, by this uh, anti treaty versus anti-treaty um, thing. And, um, uh, yeah, social, uh, you know, anti-treaty Republicans became socially ostracized. You know, there were even priests who refused to bury uh, irregulars who had been uh, shot. Uh, sometimes even just shot, on, on, like I said, on site, kind of out of hand. They refused to bury them. Um, and uh, this uh, established, really, uh, a powerful apparatus of, of repression as part of the Irish Free State um, against Republicans. Uh, that very much lasts to this day, even in Ireland. There are still special courts, 
special divisions of the police that investigate uh, dissident, you know, Republicans, obviously everyone's familiar with this phrase now, rather than irregular Republicans. Um, and much of it is targeted at, at, uh, at families, you know, and in many ways being a dissident Republican is kind of a family business in Ireland. But uh, people who, you know, maybe their grandfather was like a dissident IRA person or whatever, they still are, uh, uh, you know, surveilled or whatever by the Irish state. Um, but before all of this, before all this kind of uh, this fighting, really, it's important to note, I think, um, that the anti-treaty cause had been dealt a very heavy blow in the 1922 Dole elections. Um, I won't dwell on this, but the, um, the pro-treaty parties, essentially, the pro-treaty side of Sinn Féin, as well as the, the Irish Labour Party, and most of the other parties, even the ones that were you know, neutral on the treaty question, de facto they supported the treaty. Um, they easily won well over 50% of the votes in this, uh, in this election, just before the, uh, the, the fighting really began. Now, you could argue, I think, that the election was maybe not representative. It certainly wasn't like a, a straight referendum on the treaty, as some like to portray it. Um, but, it's, but it points to one of the anti-treaty forces' problems, which was a, a kind of lack of popular support for their, uh, for their campaign. You know, many, we can explain this, that many workers and poor farmers in Ireland were really exhausted by war and conflict. You know, we had not just the War of Independence breaking out, but uh, the First World War and everything as well. And all the economic disruption and dislocation that uh, that, that caused, um, people wanted it to, to end, really, and they wanted to, a return to kind of a period of, of peace. Um, as well as the you know, widespread belief, I think, that the anti-treaty view could be included within the structure of the new Irish uh, Free State. There was no need, essentially, people thought, for violence between Irish people. Uh, once the British had left, then what, what need was there to, to start a civil war and, uh, and fight and kill each other? Um, but the anti-treaty movement itself was, uh, was quite divided, worth mentioning. Um, you had <coughs> militarists like Chief of Staff Liam Lynch, um, who uh, essentially just wanted to maintain the IRA as a guerrilla force in the kind of rural parts of Ireland to prevent the consolidation of the, uh, the Irish Free State. You had people like Rory O'Connor that led the Four Courts occupation. They wanted instead to try and spark uh, new fighting uh, with the British um, by launching these kind of occupations and, uh, and insurrections and things like this. Um, and then you had others like Eamon de Valera who saw a more political path. They, believed that uh, the armed struggle was, was doomed, it was over, they really had no chance. Um, and in fact, De Valera would ultimately mandate uh, the disarming of the anti-treaty IRA in May 1923, which really marked, I guess, the, 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 the end proper of the Irish Civil War um, after, like I said, around 10 months. Um, but interestingly as well, for us to learn, there were signs of a, of a left wing developing in the IRA uh, in this period. Liam Mellows, who uh, is kind of commemorated today as an Irish Republican, uh, is a bit more well remembered. Uh, he was one of the IRA leaders in the Four Courts occupation, uh, for which he would be jailed and uh, executed uh, in November. Now, I caught Mellows was inspired by that famous Irish Marxist, James Connolly. Uh, he had an interest in socialism and Bolshevism, and in fact, he thought that the IRA would have to develop itself uh, politically and develop links to the Comintern and to the Soviet Union. Um, and he advocated that the anti-treaty movement uh, adopt a, a socialist program to win popular support uh, against the, uh, the openly counter-revolutionary Irish Free State. Um, and this idea was even passed around you know, in uh, Liam Lynch's kind of a Munster Republic. There's this idea, if we're going to establish a kind of breakaway of a breakaway, then um, we need to have a, a program to win people over. Now, Mellows and, uh, and uh, James Connolly, you know, they drew very, very similar conclusions um, about the need for the struggle for Irish national liberation to be led by the working class um, on a programme of establishing a workers' republic in Ireland. Um, they uh, came from very different backgrounds, um, despite drawing these key conclusions. You know, Connolly of trade unions and industrial struggle uh, whereas Mellows, all his life was a uh, you know an IRA member, uh, an IRA uh, guerrilla. Um, so throughout this, um, well, I guess pri just prior to this kind of period, anyway, throughout the, the the revolutionary period, the development of a mass revolutionary republican socialism um, certainly existed in potential all throughout Ireland. There were many episodes of it, of it uh, kind of cracking through the surface, really. 
Um, but there was never any kind of political center around which it could really crystallize. Um, it formed, or began to form, kind of a, a bit too late. You know, James Connolly was executed too early to play this kind of role, and, uh, and uh, Mellows drew these conclusions too late and was obviously uh, also executed. Um, just uh, at the same time as the, the counter-revolution was really gaining strength in Ireland behind the, the betrayal of um, these uh, bourgeois nationalists who agreed to the, the treaty. Um, but it did begin to form in some sectors of the, uh, the anti-treaty movement, and after it would go underground, there would be something of a kind of lineage uh, after that. Um, but really, <coughs> the left wing never really played like that big of a role. Uh, ultimately, de Valera, he maintained his hegemonic uh, leadership over the Republican movement. Um, now, de Valera is far from a revolutionary figure, um, he, in fact, is a pure bourgeois opportunist politician, really, um, and very, very conservative in, uh, in, in all of his uh, views, basically, economically, socially, and so on. Um, his opposition to the treaty was, was in reality, quite skin deep. Uh, I mean, some have theorized that it was all to do with just his uh, maybe jealousy of Michael Collins, but I don't think so. I think uh, he had uh, a much kind of bigger um, uh, ideas in mind. Um, but he advocated, essentially after disarming the anti-treat IRA, a reformist path to uh, creating a republic. Um, and in fact, even you know, years later, he would become president of the Irish Free State, and he would gradually convert it into an Irish republic, just by changing the name, basically. Um, and uh, while president, you know, he would actually even support um, the continued repression of uh, anti-treaty uh, IRA and anti-treaty republicans. So um, he betrayed them as well, really. Um, it was uh, W.T. Cosgrave, though, one of the, in fact, the most conservative of the Sinn Féin politicians. He would come to lead the new Irish Free State Government, um, and he led it on a programme of, of absolute reaction. Besides the, uh, the repression of the anti-treaty IRA, um, there were also attacks on the working class, cuts to paying conditions, attacks on unionisation. Um, they... Uh, tried to establish ties, close ties to the capitalist class, you know, the, the big bourgeois in Ireland who are obviously very closely connected to Britain, um, as well as, you know, established trade deals and so on, like around the Commonwealth. Essentially, they wanted to get back to, to business as usual for Irish capitalism. None that they had planted themselves as the kind of new, um, you know, committee for managing this whole thing. Um, and it was a period of, uh, of austerity and, and social instability, the early years of the Free State, um, that, that really crowned the victory of the counter-revolution in, uh, in Ireland. And it was thoroughly reactionary. You know, that for the first couple of years of his existence, the Irish Free State really teetered on the edge of a military coup d'etat. Um, members of the Irish National Army, they, they were unhappy with how things were going on, and they uh, multiple times kind of threatened to, to take charge and get rid of all the politicians. Um, but the, uh, the governing party that Cosgrave led, uh, and many of Collins' former supporters kind of joined, the Cum and the Gael, was you know ultra nationalistic, um, you know very Catholic, conservative, um, anti communist, um, and would eventually in the 1930s boys uh, go on to uh, sympathise with with fascism. They would send their members to go and fight for Franco in Spain, and in fact they even during the uh, the First World War, some of their members advocated making a, making a deal with Hitler to help him help him invade Britain basically. Um, this Cumann na Gael is is now the uh, Fine Gael, which is one of the largest parties in Ireland. Um, but this kind of revolution came from within Irish republicanism, I think is the important point to, to, to stress, from the nationalist bourgeois and petty bourgeois. Rather than, uh, they would rather compromise with British imperialism uh, and form a kind of semi-colonial state, as they did, um, th and win sort of concessions for themselves, um, and, uh, and therefore implement a kind of return to order for the lower classes. All these upheavals uh, had to come to, to an end. Um, and indeed, many of them, these bourgeois nationalists, they had uh, openly opposed many, much of the class struggle as it happened. Uh, it went on during the War of Independence, the, the mass mobilizations. They offered no support to things like the Limerick Soviet or whatever. Uh, and in fact, they, um, the, they wanted it entirely subordinated to, to the military guerrilla campaign. Um, but this, uh, this betrayal of the bourgeois nationalists, um, you know, it aligned completely with the interests of, of British imperialism at the time. Um, to use the nationalists to return order to Ireland and to govern Ireland, to protect the essential interests of British capital and uh, of, of British trade, 
um, even if they had to loosen you know, their political control over Ireland, as they, as they did. Um, and this uh, same semi-colonial counter-revolutionary state um, is what exists in Ireland today, across 26 of its counties. Um, it's evolved in form into a republic in name only, of course, but it's still very much dominated by foreign capital, by landlords and by, by rentiers. It's not the republic that was decreed in 1916, and certainly not the one that many in the IRA, I think, uh, fought for and were fighting for. And I think um, we can see from this uh, whole episode that, uh, from the likes of people like uh, de Valera, Cosgrave and others, that a conservative bourgeois nationalist, even if they act in a revolutionary way, they're still what they are at the end of the day. They're still a conservative bourgeois nationalist. And in fact, many of them even joked about this. It was Cosgrave who said, we are the most conservative people ever to have made a revolution. Um, because they had extremely conservative aims, of course. Um, and this is the lesson I think we have to learn from most of the Republican leaders uh, and from the kind of uh, the, the counter-revolution that the Civil War represented. The leaders like de Valera, Griffith, Cosgrave, um, and even Collins, I think, himself. There's still many legends that surround him. There are many on the, uh, on the kind of uh, you know, dissident Republican left or right even today who um, they still uphold, hold up Collins, obviously, as a heroic figure. And they're kind of, there are a lot of legends around, you know, who he didn't, he did that because he didn't mean to and so on. But I think we have to be honest, really, that Collins is, was just a man and um, was subject to this, to momental historical pressures. And what ability did he have to resist it? He didn't have a, uh, a revolutionary program necessarily to stand on. Instead, all he had was uh, this kind of practical approach to struggling for Irish freedom. But to summarise or to conclude, I guess. Um, I have already one sentence, but uh, as, as James Connolly wrote, really, and uh, I think is the lesson for, of, of Ireland's revolution, it's lost revolution, perhaps. Not really lost, its revolution is yet to happen and be completed. But the main lesson is that it's only the working class who are the incorruptible inheritors of the struggle for Irish freedom. And we'll continue that today. <laughs>